بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له الملك الحق المبين الذي سهل لعباده إلى مرضات سبيلا وأوضح لهم الهداية وجعل الرسول عليها دليلا وأشهد أن محمد عبد الله ورسوله الذي بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة وكشف الغمة ونصح للأمة وجاهد في سبيل الله حق جهاده وتركنا على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك اللهم صل وسلم على هذا النبي الحبيب محمد وعلى آله وصحابته ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فيا عباد الله إني أحبكم في الله وأوصيكم ونفسي أولا بتقوى الله ومن يتق الله يجعل له مخرجا ويزقه من حيث لا يحتسب عباد الله قال الله تعالى في محكم كتاب العزيز أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وجعل منها زوجها ليسكن إليها فلما تغشاها حملت حملا خفيفا فمرت به فلما أثقلت دعوى الله ربهما لئن آتيتنا صالحا لنكونن من الشاكرين صدق الله العظيم My dear brothers in Islam Last month in March International Women's Day was celebrated all over the world That's a day, a global day to celebrating to celebrate the economic, political and social achievements of women throughout the world It also is a day of ex expressing love, respect, and appreciation towards women in our lives. It is also a day to draw attention to the hardships and the discriminations placed among women. Now we hear many khutbas talking about the rights Islam gave to women. We might have heard a lot, we have read a lot, not only in theory, even in practical terms, it was demonstrated in the early generations. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Innama bu'aythu mu'alliman. I have been sent down as a teacher. So he, he taught people what, what is needed to reform. One of the aspects was to elevate the status of women at that time. You know that how, uh, what kind of low level women lived during the time of Jahiliyyah. Rasulullah came to elevate the status of women. Islam gave such high importance for women at that time. So it was not on in, only in theory, but even in example. In practical life, we saw this uh, movement, the women are taking, women are expressing, women are enjoying what Islam, the, the rights Islam gave. Starting from Aisha radiallahu anha, she was Rasulullah's wife. And about her, the Imams always say that she is half of the knowledge. She has such a wealth of knowledge. She enjoyed the freedom Islam gave her to participate in all levels of community affairs. She was not just a housewife. Her contributions can be seen in social, political, religious and economic uh, life. Not only in religious life. Asha anha, was an inspiration to all the women who came after her. They wanted to emulate her. They wanted to live like her. They wanted to uh, succeed like Aisha radiallahu anha. So we see in the subsequent uh, Islamic history, women who excelled as jurists, faqih, and scholars of hadith, and poets, and reformers, and intellectuals, etc. Imam Ibn Qadir al-Asqalani, in his al Iswaba fi Tamiz al-Sahaba, in his book, he counts at one period of time there were 1,551 women scholars at, his, at that point of time. Imam Sakhawi, in his book, he writes about 1,075 high caliber scholars, female scholars, during that time, at one period. Um, there's a scholar called Akram Nadri. He was in uh, Oxford. He, in 2007, he wanted to compile a, a book, a compilation of uh, female scholars in Islamic history. Before he compiled in the book, he thought that he will come, he, he said in an interview, he said he will come across about 20, 25 
high caliber women scholars. But subhanallah, in the end, he had to write a 40 volume book about the complete life story of 8,000 women scholars in Islam. Now all these were accomplished. We were talking about these women when Greek and Roman cultures, they were in the high, high pinnacle of, uh, pinnacle of success. But still they could not produce even one philo women's philosopher at that time. Islam produced 8,000 people and more. Because of her modesty, no, not everything is written. And also if you take the Europe, Europe until 1700s, they could not see a female jurist. Only after 1700 years, they started to produce female jurists. The women get their rights to excel in education and all the community affairs. But Islam Muslim women, throughout their history, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they excelled as jurists and fuqaha. Islam, what Islam did was it did all, quite the opposite in all levels. It produced, it gave women the highest freedom. They enjoyed the high status that even it was unthinkable at that time. Let me today in this khutbah, I will just pinpoint briefly about seven such examples of our ummahat, our mothers who excelled in community life. That will, under, that will give you an understanding of the breadth and the depth of what I'm talking about. The first one is Rubia bint Mu'awbiz bin Afra. She was a great narrator of hadith. Scholars would go to her after Rasulullah wasallam about to learn from her hadith. She was specialized in the ablution, the hadith of ablution. People from all over the world will come to her to learn about the hadith of ablution. Abu Bakr was there, Umar radiallahu an, Uthman, Ali radiallahu these are Khulafa scholars at the time. But despite the presence of these uh, Khalifas, Khulafas, they will go to um, Afra to learn from her. Abdullah ibn Abbas, who was a great scholar of uh, Tafsir, he is, uh, uh, he is one of the students of Afra. Also, Ali ibn Zayl Abdeen, who is the great great grands, grandson of Ali radiallahu an. Now the second one is Amra bint Abdurrahman. She was a jurist at the same time, a legal scholar, a lawyer, at the same time a mufti, a hadith scholar. Now it's hard to find a muhaddith at the same time as a faqih. At the same time she was a hadith scholar, a muhaddith, a faqih and also a mufti. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz said that if you want to learn hadith, go to Amra. And in another Sahabi, Imam Zuhuri said that, go to Amra, she is a boundless ocean of knowledge. At one time, a judge in Medina, he, 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 he gives an, issues an verdict about a Syrian Christian who stole something to cut off his hand. Amra heard about that, she said that, no, it should not be cut because whatever he stole is less than one dinar. So the hudud cannot be applied at this point. So once the judge heard and he overturned that rule. He did not question who Amra is. He did not ask a second opinion. This is the respect they gave for Amra and also at that time the women scholars at that time. Interestingly, Imam Zahabi, when he says about the Muhaddisun, when he talks about Muhaddis, he says that in Islamic, the whole Islamic history, you cannot find a women, female scholar Muhaddis who has reported a Mawdu Hadith. A fabricated hadith. All the fabricators of hadith are from among men. There's not a single woman you can pinpoint that, that, that shows their intellectual integrity. They are honest, they are sincere in their, intell in, in their intellectuality. The third one is Aisha bin Abdul, Abdul Hadi. She, was, she taught in Grand Mosque in Damas Damascus. She was appointed by the Sultan at that time as the master of hadith. She taught Shaykh al Bukhari. She represented the whole community. And interestingly, they could not find any man at that time equal to her caliber. Imam Hajj al-Asqalani also studied more than 100 books with Aisha bint Abdul Hadi. Now the fourth woman is Umm Darda. She was a Sahabiya. She also taught in Damascus and Jerusalem in present-day Palestine. Imams, jurists, and Hadith scholars will attend her class. Abdul Malik bin Marwan, at the time he was a khali uh, Khalifa. He ruled from Spain <coughs> to India. And he himself is a scholar, not like present day Muslim uh, rulers. He himself is a scholar. 
he will come and learn from Umm Darda. Umm Darda was in her old advanced age when she wanted to go to the uh, mosque. Uh, Abdul Malik bin Marwan, she will lean on Abdul Malik bin Marwan's shoulder and go to the mosque, walk to the mosque. And Marwan, the Khalifa, will wait until she finishes her prayers and come back, take her back to the mosque where she will continue teaching. And the fifth uh, woman is Fatima bint Ibrahim al Jauhar. She was teacher of Imam Bukhari. She also taught Imam Zahabi and Imam Subaqi. Whenever she goes to Hajj, all of the scholars from all of the Islamic world will hear that she's coming to Hajj. They will always come and they want to learn from her. They will come at the same time to learn from her. And interestingly, my dear brothers in Islam, uh, when she goes to Medina, in the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Mosque, when she will teach Hadith, she's old age, she will lean on the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's grave. She will lean on that and she will teach. After finish teaching, she will sign off all the hadith for students to narrate on behalf on, on, the, on her authority. A Syrian woman also has been reported in Al Bidaya or Nihaya. Her name is not mentioned. During, she lived the, the, during the time of Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyyah, Ibn Hajj al Qalani. All these great scholars. That was the golden age. But she had a positive, positive influence in the society. She reformed communities in Damascus and also Cairo. Ibn Kathir, he refers to her as she, this woman, accomplished more than her male counterparts accomplished at that time. The last one, not the least, is Fatima al samarqandiya She was an expert in hadith. She is the wife of Imam Qasani. Imam Qasani is a Hanafi scholar who wrote the famous Hanafi fiqh masterpiece, Bada is Sonai. The, his, his students will say that sometime Imam uh, Qasani will face some questions he cannot answer. At that time he will go back to home, his home. When he comes back, he will elucidate, he will explain in great detail the answer for that question. Only later on they found out that whenever he goes inside, he will post the same question from his wife Fatima Samarkandiya. She will give the answer to her husband. He will come back and he will explain to her students. My dear brothers in Islam, such is the glorious history of Muslim, female, Muslim women in this history. It was a golden age full of potential, proactive, confident Muslim women. They were active in public life, not only in uh, uh, family life. They were active in public life as well as in intellectual life. Their identity was not questioned. That's a very important thing. Nobody questioned, who are you to question me? Who are you to teach? Who are you to lean on the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam grave and teach? We cannot even think of that now. And their gender was not questioned, very important. Nobody asked, you are a female, I am a male, I have authority, no. The gender was not questioned. And their authority was not questioned either. As I said in the beginning, some judges, they overturned their rule because of a verdict given by a woman. They possessed independent religious responsibility as mandated by Quran and Hadith. This is the brighter side of the coin. My dear brothers in Islam, if you look at the flip side of the coin, unfortunately, it is not very bright. It is gloom and dark. It is, it is really an unfortunate situation what our Ummah is going through now. In fact, if you see the history put in a chart that they went higher and higher in status, it should have continued. It should have continued. We should have had more than eight, eight, maybe 800,000 eight women scholars at this time. At the rate it went high and high. But somewhere it stopped. It started coming down stumbling. We don't see. The progress was, should have taken up. But what happened? To now to understand the present day status of women in general, I will give some statistics. Among, among people in the whole world live in abject poverty, that is, who live in less than one dollar per day, 70% of them are women. And out of all world's land which people own, only less than 1% is owned by women, registered under their name. And 860, 876 million illiterate people are in this world. Out of that, two, one, two thirds are women. 75 percent of them uh, of refugees and internally displaced people are women. They suffer a lot. 
If you look at Muslim countries, the numbers are even worse. Not only this, not only poverty, but added to that is domestic violence. Added to that is honor killings. <coughs> added to that is degrading of women quoting Quran and Hadith. <coughs> and if you see the alarming, the disparity between men and women in Muslim countries, that is really alarming. In Morocco, for example, male adult, lit adult literacy rate is 65.7, but women, 39.6. In Pakistan, 63% male are literate, women only 36%. In Egypt, 83% was, 83 versus 59. In India, 75% of all Muslim women are considered illiterate. If you take the whole Arab world, 50% of them are considered illiterate. Let me give you another statistic. In Israel, some people don't want to hear the name Israel. In Israel, male literacy rate is 98.5, women literacy rate is 95.9. In Albania, 99.2, women is 98.3. And Europe, most of the countries, is almost equal or very slantly. There's a disparity. Now, you may say that we cannot compare Israel and Albania and Europe with the Muslim countries because of the population, because of the colonialization. You can go on and on. I agree. It is not, I'm not comparing apples to apples or oranges to oranges. But what I'm saying is that if you look deep inside the Muslim communities and Muslim countries, and even in here, even in the West, wherever Muslim communities live, if you see deep inside, it shows a trend, a worse trend, a social setting, a dark side of social setting. That is, men, we are preferred over women. <coughs> we receive preferential treatment. In Asian countries too. We know that nobody can deny that. I come from that background. So we can understand what's going on. We receive preferential treatment, men receive preferential treatment over Muslim women and at the same time women are looked at this degrading and discriminating attitude. That's the attitude they receive. If, if you look at a, a girl and a boy at one family, the boy will receive preferential treatment, not the girl. Muslim, have been margin, Muslim women have been marginalized and sidelined. Sometimes it's very ironical that when we come to the West and we always blame the West, not only the, coming to the West, even when we are in the East, from there the first thing we do is we blame the West. Why? Women are looked at commodity, like a product. Like we always say, they, they, don't, they don't care, I mean, they, they go out and they do that and this, commodity. They are in the far, uh, that extreme. But my dear brothers in Islam, honestly, if we look at ourselves, don't we see, don't we also see the same way at women, but in the other extreme? We also see as a commodity. She doesn't have feelings, she doesn't have dreams, she doesn't have aspirations. She's one person to stay inside home and look after my children. We don't even care how much education she gives to the children. A boy who goes to the school, when comes back home, her mother cannot compete with him. The mother is still the same mother whom I migrated or who was born ever since she was here. If you, in Canada, for example, 58% of graduates who come out from all Canadian universities are women. Alhamdulillah, a sizable number is Muslim women, Muslim girls. They're educated, they, are in, they have a capacity, they have potential, but if you look, how many of them are leading Islamic centers? How many of them are at least in the committees of masjids? How many of them are leading big projects in this, within the Islamic community? Who is leading? Where are these women? In the uh, US, if they did a survey on four religious communities, Jewish, Christian, and Muslims and another religious community. 
they found out that Muslim women, in on average, have more wealth than their male counterpart. When they looked at the, all the other communities, Muslim women has the highest wealth. But if you look into the social settings, they are the most disrespected. They're most, they are the most discriminated. We see Muslim women in all the other professional life, but when it comes to Islamic centers, Islamic life, Muslim community life, they are all but absent. Sometimes we see, uh, we try, we, uh, we praise, we appreciate when we see a high caliber women in the other societies. We do that all the time. Look at how strong she is, look at how educated she is, look at the way she manages a large organization. But when there's a Muslim woman at the same position, same caliber, same education capacity, we don't want to accept that. We don't want to accept that. And why is this anti-women practices or women phobia, I would say? My dear brothers in Islam, we are, unfortunately, we are denying, while we are denying the rights of women, we are denying half of the knowledge. Half of them are women. They are not part of our growth. This is what happens when we don't follow what has been given to us in our Islamic history with glorious examples. Very interesting, the other thing is that the public perception about women and men's segregation is so strong that even sometimes if a man wanted to give space to women and include them, he will be seen as some, someone with a bad motives. He will be branded. This guy has something to do. I mean, why, do, why does he want women to come forward? It is among the women too. Some Muslim women, Muslim girls, too have the same attitude. When another sister is going forward and trying to do, uh, build communities, side by side with men, they think she has a problem. That's why, my dear brothers in Islam, we are seen as a women oppressing community. They don't see how, what, what the Quran says, they don't see what the Hadith says. Non-Muslims, Muslims around them, people around us, they cannot see, they don't read the Quran, they don't read the Hadith. They don't even read the Islamic history, all these 8,000 women I was talking about. All that they see is how they see practically every day, day to day life in their Muslim neighbor's life, in Muslim colleagues' life. All the statistics, when it comes out from UNESCO, in any, any other bodies, even the Gallup Foundation, when they do, they see these are the results. We can shout inside the mosque that we are treating women equally, we are respecting women, they are our mothers, they are Hadiths. We can say, we can shout. But outside, what they see is that how these women are treated in our community. They see where are these women? In the Islamic centers, where are the leadership? What, 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 why do we talk about leaders, Muslim leaders? Don't we have Muslim female leaders? There's something fundamental wrong here, my dear brothers in Islam. We see Fatima bin Ibrahim al-Jawhar teaching at Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa mosque, the highest, one of the respected mosques, the main two mosques, after Mac uh, the main mosque after Mecca, Kaaba. But now, at this, at this time, how many mosques have closed the doors for women? How many mosques? Even if there's a place, unfortunately, my dear brothers in Islam, I have to say the truth, but sometimes it's dark, crumpled and dirty places for women. They come out, they will just, we, we pack them all into their small room and when they go out, nobody is even looking, nobody is even asking their feedback. How do you do? Was it, facilities are okay? But the men will be always asked, how do you, how do you like the food? Was it good? It happens. There are many reasons. You may ask, what, what, are, what are the reasons? Why it happened? Why it came from 180% turn? There are people advocating actively to keep women sidelined. Muslims, why it happened? There are many reasons. There are social reasons, there are economic reasons, there are political reasons. But unfortunately, my dear brothers in Islam, 
there is a main reason is some religious reasons too. The way we understood our religion, the way we interpret our religion, the way we explain our religion. Sheikh Ghazali said, this is the ascension of Bedouin fiqh. What is Bedouin fiqh? Whenever you talk about the rights of the uh, women, they come up with the hadith of fiqh. Sheikh Ghazali said, this is Bedouin fiqh. What is Bedouin fiqh? What he meant was just, just like in contemporary culture, where the world revolves around men, and everything should be in service to men, even the fiqh at one point has been understood in the same way. Our religious interpretations, rulings, jurisprudence, all have a male-centric nature. Inshallah, we'll continue with the same topic next month. When I continue, we'll see what are the reasons, what are the common misconceptions about women. How we understand the Quranic verses, how some of the hadith uh, explanations given some, uh, for some societies. At certain point of time, when Islam was in decline, those interpretations have been still we are following. No matter where we learn. So inshallah, in my next khutbah, we'll continue to understand what had uh, led, what caused the discrepancy uh, among, women, among male and ma uh, women, and also uh, how these women were denied the, uh, their right to progress and their right to contribute. That is an important, uh, important lesson. Because we need contribution from them. We need to uh, see their knowledge. We need to use their knowledge. But it has been denied. So inshallah, in our next khutbah, we will continue. وآخر الحمد لله رب العالمين بارك الله بارك الله لنا ولكم بالقرآن العظيم ونفعنا بالآيات والذكر الحكيم منه تعالى جواد كريم ملك عظيم ضر رؤوف رحيم ورب الحليم استغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم